Uh, my talk today concerns recent publications of translations of e-traditional literature, especially so-called epic poems and related long ritual texts. I will first give a brief overview of what I see as the arc of development of e-literature studies since the 1950s, then note several very recent publications that attempt to introduce traditional e-literature to the world utilizing English as a language of interaction. I will then focus on the translation of No Wotoyi or Book of Origins, a key narrative that is connected to many facets of spiritual and cultural life of the Nosu subgroup of E. I will also mention similar developments in texts translated from other local literatures in southwest China and briefly introduce contemporary E poetry, which since its blossoming in the 1980s has often incorporated elements of traditional myth, ritual, epic, and folklore. This is just a, a map of uh, basically sort of the area that we're dealing with uh, here. Um, I'll give a little bit of background on things. We have a couple of experts on e traditional uh, script here we'll be presenting, so I won't say too much about it. Um, but traditional e writing. Uh, was in various uh, local scripts. Uh, we have examples of this going way back, uh, uh, carvings, casting, scrolls, etc. some of these supposedly over a thousand years old in terms of the uh, castings in metal. Um, differing script traditions in Sichuan, Yunnan, and Guizhou. Uh, writing was the provenance of uh, Bimo uh, ritualists. Uh, this sort of priest, uh, though in earlier times uh, might have been known by uh, other uh, people. Um, some of these early uh, stone carvings and things like that would seem to indicate that at least somebody else uh, knew these scripts. Uh, the origins of the script, as far as I know, are unknown. Um, some scholars say they may date to the Tang Dynasty, some people say earlier, um, some people say later. Uh, I'm not really uh, again, I'll let our linguists discuss that. Uh, early existing written texts uh, on paper, anyway, would probably date, I guess, to the late Ming or early Qing. Um, the script is still used, the written script by Bimo priests today, uh, especially throughout uh, southern Sichuan province. Uh, by the 1970s, there was a standardized uh, Northern E script. It has limited use today in the Liangshan E Autonomous Prefecture in Southern Sichuan Province. Uh, it's still used uh, in, I guess, some newspapers. I've seen it in uh, textbooks in middle schools and high schools, and even things like chemistry books, uh, mathematical books, things like that. And uh, the use by this that I'm most interested in is uh, by uh, contemporary poets, uh, who I'll talk about a little bit later uh, in the talk. Uh, here's an image of uh, Bimo Priest from a large uh, international <laughs> e gathering that uh, some of us attended back, I guess it was my, my day, my recollection is in 2005 in, uh, in Megu, and this was part of a a large event that had, I think, over 60 uh, Bimo from the area participating in some of these reenactments of uh, rituals. You can see that one of uh, the priests is holding uh, one of the written scrolls uh, there. Um, I've started to use this uh, sort of term, uh, transmutation of uh, traditional e-literature since the 1950s. Um, Pre-1949, we've got various collections of e-texts going on. Um, I think that this may have started uh, back in the early, or rather late 19th century with one of the French missionaries in the uh, Sani areas. Um, and then uh, Professor Mashwell Liang was one of the uh, Chinese uh, scholars, uh, ethnolinguists, who collected many texts, and, and many, many other texts were collected and uh, now exist in various places around the world. In the 1950s, uh, the government led uh, various uh, collection teams uh, consisting of uh, students and teachers, uh, mostly uh, from universities in Yunnan, 
and uh, they uh, had several collection projects in uh, parts of uh, especially northern Yunnan and uh, the Northeast, uh, collecting texts like uh, Ashrama, Mega, Cham, uh, Saibomo, uh, which is the uh, seventh sister and the uh, serpent, uh, or snake and, or serpent and human Mary. And these were uh, collected, uh, again, by these teams who went out. They didn't have tape recorders or what have you. It was a very, very tedious prog. Uh, process of working through sometimes several people to get, you know, the things translated. Some of these texts were from oral performances, such as uh, Mega, other of them, like Chamu, uh, were based on uh, written texts. Uh, there were a lot of issues with reliability and collection methods, but nevertheless, these texts have been uh, reprinted over and over again since the late 1970s, after the Cultural Revolution and into the early 1980s. Uh, some of these are, have even been retranslated, as I'll talk about later, and published just in the last year or so. So, regardless of what we think about the reliability of these texts, they're having a, a huge impact um, on representation of the E uh, in the uh, public consciousness. Uh, from the mid-1980s to early 2000s, uh, more texts appear in Chinese translation. That is the medium that these things are going into. Uh, or in multilinear versions, uh, sometimes with e graphs, sometimes with IPA format, uh, sometimes in northern e pinyin, sometimes with word-for-word -word Chinese uh, vernacular uh, text. Uh, Xinan uh from Bijia area in Guizhou, they've done a lot of uh, these multilinear texts have been published. Um, Ashrama has been published, uh, that uh, epic poem of the Sani people has been published uh, numerous times in various formats. Also a text uh, called Pupaji, which is not the origin uh, of the local Sani people uh, from Shirling. And then texts such as the, the runaway bride story, Gamo Anyo from uh, uh, Liangshan area in Sichuan, uh, Mamu Tai, No Tai, these are a uh, book of teaching, book of origins, and so forth uh, from Sichuan province. All of these have appeared in various sorts of uh, uh, published uh, versions. Uh, then from the early 2000s, around what, 2006, 2007 or so, you get this influence of the intangible cultural heritage initiatives on China, which have uh, really been this massive force that is transforming uh, folk traditions in China today, or at least the public representation of them. And there's also been a concurrent stimulus by the government to uh, bring back appreciation of uh, traditional sorts of uh, uh, folk life uh, in <laughs> through, through the filter of uh, the uh, uh, modern sort of sense of what the tradition is uh, in China. And e-texts have uh, been part of this. Um, in 1980s to 2020, there's also been a utilization of elements of traditional literature and folklore in modern e-poetry. Uh, most of this is written in Chinese, but there is a group of poets, um, which I'll talk about later, uh, who use northern e to compose in. So they use a modern version of the traditional script. Um, I'll be talking a little bit about uh, some translations of epics. Um, I recently did a paper that was published in uh, China Pearl uh, Papers uh, in the U.S. about uh, these collections, so I won't go into it too much today, but there's been a lot of these texts uh, collected. Some of them were collected from various ethnic groups in the 1950s, and they're still being uh, collected today. And again, they appear in sometimes these multilinear texts with uh, um, some version of the original language, IPA, so forth. Some are based on oral performances, some are on written texts, and so forth. So you, you can break these down into the numerous sorts of categories that they um, appear in. But this uh, notion of epic, uh, which in the past, you know, there was this notion that China didn't have epics, but uh, later on that's, uh, this term has become quite fashionable over the last 20 or so years, uh, in, or 30 years, in representing this uh, work of the uh, literary work of eth various ethnic minority groups in China. Uh, here's a few examples uh, from E, Miao, and Hoods, and of these texts. Again, some of these appear 
in a multilinear format. Uh, some of them are simply translated into Chinese, uh, but there, and some of them appear uh, in completely in, uh, say, e-language or what have you. So we have to have this whole variety of things. But I think what's important is that they are being published and they are being uh, distributed in some fashion. Um, so examples of recent publications regarding traditional e-literature in China. So uh, there are, in some case, reproductions and introductions of these traditional e-scripts where uh, they take uh, the traditional scrolls or what have you and make photo images of them and then basically put them into a modern book form, sometimes with an introduction in Chinese or maybe even e, uh, sometimes without that. And then again, these various multilinear editions. And these are published by official uh, publishing houses, including some of these ethnic publishing houses in Guizhou, Yunnan, and Sichuan. Some of these projects seem to now be published, uh, self-publishing happens. Sometimes even these uh, texts that have been published by the official texts seem to be being funded by uh, people who have a lot of money or families who want these things published and, and, and you know, and so they help out with the publishing of these things. And one example of uh, one of these recent publications is from, from the Shaoliangshan area on the Sichuan-Yunnan border, uh, northwest uh, uh, Yunnan, and it's called the E.B. More Scriptures from Shaoliangshan, and it's a 10-volume set uh, edited by Lu Bao, Sheng, and Lu Zhifa, which are kind of local intellectuals there in Shaoliangshan. And again, it's these photocopies of these original Bimo manuscripts with translated titles and short prefaces in Chinese, um, but, not, um, but the texts themselves are not translated. Um, they're just uh, there for anyone who uh, is able to read them. Um, I also, uh, there's scholars at the Yonsei University in Korea have translated Mei Gu and Cham from uh, uh, these texts from northern uh, Yunnan, Chushong area that just were published in the last year or so. Um, so here's uh, this example here of these uh, Shaoliang uh, uh, Shan texts. You can see over here, you've got this image of uh, Juga Alu, the, uh, the uh, hero who shoots down the extra suns and moons. Uh, that are overheating the earth uh, in the epics. Um, so I'll mention a few examples of recent English translations of these e epics now. Uh, this actually is a, uh, a singer from the uh, Urbian region uh, in uh, southern Sichuan who's singing the uh, Gamo Anio story about the runaway uh, bride. And it's sort of a bridal lament and usually two singers sing this. This is sort of an example of an oral uh, sort of narrative uh, poem. And again, this, this was, uh, has been published in Chinese translation. I'm thinking about translating this at some point into English. Um, as we get into this English translation of these texts, there's something that uh, I find quite fascinating, and this is there's this uh, sort of a move uh, on the part of groups of Chinese translators who are translating Chinese classics and minority epics into um, English in Chinese. They're not native speakers, but they've taken upon themselves to translate uh, these items of uh, uh, eth uh, ethnic minority literature into English for what audience? Evidently just an international audience. So there's an increase in a number of epics translated by Chinese translation teams, uh, again due to this intangible cultural heritage agendas and money supplied by them. Uh, I'm aware of quite a few Chinese translation teams, sometimes multi-ethnic, sometimes they're Han people translating this literature, sometimes they're multi-ethnic, uh, sometimes the foreign proofreaders, um, and translated dozens of these ethnic minority epics from Chinese. And these translations actually, uh, this, this style of translation dates at least back to the 1950s with uh, Gladys Young uh, translating the Ashrama story of the Hani. Uh, 
Um, Yunnan People's Publishing House is preparing a series of translations of 17 epics from various ethnic groups in Yunnan, all by teams of Chinese translators, uh, and they're being revised that is proofread by foreign native speakers of English. Um, sometimes it seems to work uh, quite well, other times we wonder about the quality of the translations or of the English, but you know, it's serving a purpose of communicating this material. Uh, for instance, the press, uh, Yunnan People's Publishing House, released two versions of the Yunnan E epic, and again, it's an oral epic, it's not in written form. Uh, the written form is in Chinese now. Um, it's called Mei Ge, and it's based on a composite version uh, published in Chinese in 1959 and republished in the 70s, 90s, and 2000s in Chinese. And it's based on oral performances of Chu Yi Autonomous Prefecture in Northern Yunnan, uh, the Lipo subgroup of Yi. This is, uh, um, this is a picture of Gao Xia, who is sort of the head of the translation team. I heard about this in the summer of 2018. They asked me to write a preface. I said, please let me see you know, your translation. Um, and when I got the translation, in the English translation, I felt it was, it was pretty good, but I spent a little bit of time you know, helping to proofread it and so forth. So this uh, text had just come out uh, in the last few uh, months. Um, and that's... Uh, the cover of the book there, and part of this first thing. It's all about origin text, creation of the world, you know, what have you. Um, so, you know, there was no mold, mold to create the sky, there was no mold to make the earth, the sky was like an umbrella, the earth was like a bridge. So it's this sort of uh, typical sort of uh, um, thing that you see in these uh, origin or creation epics from southwest China in terms of the uh, imagery, uh, the creation of the sky, and it has many, many uh, motifs uh, that it shares with other uh, epics. And, but again, this is a sort of put together uh, uh, epic uh, that was collected in the 1950s from several uh, singers and different versions of things. And there you've got the whole contents with the creation of the world and humankind, the origin of humans. Um, building houses, hunting, farming, marriage, love songs. So all of these things were songs that were gathered from various singers. It's interesting, I, I was able to interview uh, some of the collectors of this text uh, back in the 1980s. And uh, they talked about things that got into the volume and things which were not included into the volume. There's this whole thing in there about um, funerals and so forth that were actually, they told me, were actually chants by be more, but they weren't allowed to really mention that in the text, and they wrote other articles you know, about that that were published in the Nebu Press, you know, explaining what these things were. So it was quite interesting. They were quite interested in getting that material out there, but they had to had to uh, uh, go through the, the correct channels uh, to, uh, to to get it published. Um, then there's also antiphonal love songs that are included uh, in this text. Uh, so again, a, a common sort of uh, uh, format um, for oral performance in Southwest China. Um, in terms of uh, another text, probably from another end of the perspective, uh, this is a, a text that was just uh, published in 2018, or parts of a text, the whole thing is, is not actually in the book, it's mostly commentary and literary critical sort of approach to uh, traditional uh, e-literature from northern Yunnan. It's called Songs for Dead Parents, Corpse Text and World in Southwest China uh, by Eric Mugler, who's a professor of uh, anthropology at University of uh, Michigan. He wrote a, another earlier work called The Age of Wild uh, Ghosts. Again, this is uh, literary criticism, Western literary criticism and anthropology, which is sort of uh, superimposed upon uh, these traditions in Southwest China and uh, sort of uh, seeking to interpret uh, them in, uh, in various ways. Um, so the text uh, illuminates traditional funeral practices of an E subgroup, uh, mostly Lolopo in the northern Yunnan, especially the construction of these eff effigies uh, of the deceased called Bu. And uh, so it provides an enlightening intersection between local traditional beliefs, ethnography of performance, Western interpretive theory, um, 
focuses on the construction of effigies in the funeral process and the relations of the dead to the living and a long process of disentangling the dead from the shared world of matter and memory. Um, so it has a special significance for examining the relations between text, belief, and practices. So um, if you're interested in this sort of approach to things, this would be a good text uh, to use maybe in the classroom. Now the project that I've been working with uh, on for the last number of years with uh, uh, Professor Luo Chun, who's a Han Chinese uh, version of his E name, Aku Wu Wu, is Aku Wu Wu, and um, Jivo Zochu, who is a local tradition bear from a Shida uh, area of Liangshan. And this is something that we just published with the University of uh, Washington Press this last summer. The press. Uh, the preface was written by uh, Stephen Harrell, and so this is a translation of the Nuo Tei, which is the um, what I consider to be sort of the key uh, ritual text of uh, Yi uh, in the uh, Liangshan uh, area, um, Liangshan Yi Autonomous Prefecture in uh, southern Sichuan is uh, where this text was collected. Um, there's been versions of this uh, published in Chinese before. Uh, this is the first, I think, major. Um, uh, translation of this text. Uh, the text uh, survives in many, many forms. It's, there's oral performances which are done on, off of this text um, that circulate and of course those vary endlessly and then there's many, many uh, written versions uh, of this uh, text. But the text that we had was uh, obtained by Jivo Zochu from an older uh, ritualist and then he uh, over the years translated this or, or transmuted it into uh, Northern E following the text, you know, used the uh, new uh, format for the sound of the uh, uh, characters and so forth. So, um, the Nosu, again, they're uh, of about two million people, uh, upland farmers and so forth uh, from southern Sichuan. And uh, the standard uh, Northern East script is uh, based upon uh, the spoken tradition in, a, in an area of Shida. Now here's a picture of Jibo Zochu reciting passages from the Novo Te. He does not know the whole text. He usually, you know, to perform, he knows parts of it he can perform. Um, he is a um, actually not a Bimo, he's a Ndugu, he's a sort of a traditional uh, dispute arbitrator, wise man uh, in the community, but again, he took an interest in this uh, text, learned the e writing when he, he was younger, and uh, on very few occasions will recite parts of it. Um, and usually he'll have a, a written text that he'll consult before um, he does that. So this does not seem to be a real case of, of sort of oral composition. But uh, then again, uh, I have not seen him in so many contexts. So uh, young, uh, there's singers who uh, you know do these sort of uh, riffs off no Otoyi and various you know oral contacts at marriages and funerals and, and so forth. So this is, it's, it's, a, it's a complex uh, and living uh, tradition. And this is his uh, uh, sort of way of dealing with it. Uh, so again, this uh, Novo Tai, it's this uh, major traditional narrative of the Norsu. Um, it's been described as an epic or a folk encyclopedia. Um, there's a lot of things that I find interesting about it in terms of, uh, uh, the cosmography in it, the way, uh, the details of the environment and the local cultures uh, that are in it, um, how things are rooted uh, in the text, the sort of eco-genealogical sort of uh, rooting um, and the origins of sky, earth, plants, animals, and humans. And a lot of this uh, fits into these sort of uh, globalized discussions we're having about uh, indigenous studies uh, today, uh, space and place and cosmography, the pluriverse with a, um, that incl a very inclusive view of life forms and so forth. And there's also a lot of uh, themes about migration and dwelling, migrating through the landscape and dwelling within the landscape. Uh, finding an ideal place uh, to settle it. That, that's the, the, the whole last part of the text. Uh, deals with that uh, through the very experience of various clans. 
And these are just a few lines uh, from the beginning. Uh, in the most ancient past, in the vast expanse of the heavens, was the home of the sky spirit, the Guzu, and so forth. And then it goes, and, and these tend to end with, and thus is the genealogy of the sky above. So you have all of these passages that tell where things come from. Um, and there's passages that have to do with the Juga'alu, um, who was uh, the uh, a you know, mythic hero of the E people and versions of him uh, appear in various uh, local uh, E uh, literatures. Um, there's the genealogy of his mother, which is actually the only gene genealogy of a woman uh, within this text uh, before she gives birth to him after being splattered by blood from dragon eagles uh, flying above um, and so forth. Um, and these are just a few lines uh, from uh, her genealogy. You can see it goes through these various uh, clans and so forth, but she uh, did not marry. Okay, so uh, instead, Jugalu comes about uh, from this uh, marriage between uh, her and the dragon, or this relationship between her and the dragon eagles. Um, and she was out weaving in front of her house when the, uh, she saw the dragon eagles uh, fly over. Um, and uh, so forth. Uh, one uh, section of this is called the 12 branches of snow and uh, talks about the six groups that had blood and the six group with no blood. And this uh, happens after life on earth is wiped out by the global warming and then it's being replanted on earth from snow falling down uh, from the sky. And uh, so it's quite interesting in terms of sort of an eco-genealogical, eco-critical view of seeing you know, how uh, things were sort of divided up uh, in this fashion with between plants that have no blood and animals that have blood, including humans. Um, and we had this uh, whole you know, uh, small group of people who were working on this, this sort of constellation of collaborators with Aku and Jivo Zochu and his uh, um, nephew, Jibo Yitsu, and this is Aku Wu Wu here, um, who's Dean of the E-Studies at Southwest Music University. I just heard this last week that this whole Institute of E-Studies at um, Southwest University for Nationalities and the Institute for Tibetan Studies are now done, they're closed, they don't exist anymore, and it's all being put into one big department of literature right now. And this seems to be happening uh, all over. Um, that's, and here's Aku performing his Calling Back the Soul of Jugaalu, which is one of his poems that he wrote in Northern E language in 1980s. And he's very well known for this poem. And that's again, Jivo Zochu, and you can see he's carrying uh, his versions of the scriptures in his hand there. And here's a, a book from, from the Xerox copy of what we used uh, to translate. This was, again, translated out of uh, following a traditional uh, scroll that he um, put into Northern E uh, format. So it's basically the same, just the pronunciation change. And when we were doing the, tr before we started the translation, uh, Aku thought it was important that we had spiritual sanction for this, so he, uh, a Bimo named Ayu Bimo came and uh, sat with us as we started the translation and uh, opened his scrolls and so forth uh, before uh, we began. Um, um, that's Jibo Isu, and that's us working on the translation uh, together. Um, and checking the E in Chinese versions. Uh, Chinese version and ch uh, e-version will be published soon. We've got an online version of the um, Norsu Pinin uh, version that's online with, with the book that we just published. Um, so these are just some uh, pictures. Uh, some of the themes in modern uh, e-poetry, I'll wrap up, up here in a minute. Um, a lot of themes on ethnic identity and culture, cultural change, ecological change. Um, indigenous literature, um, eco-literature, place literature, ethnographic, cosmographic. Um, some of these themes uh, 
fall into what Chadwick Allen uh, talks about in his book Transindigenous about uh, Native American and Maori uh, writing. Um, I had a volume of poetry come out in 2017 where I uh, collected uh, the works of 49 different poets from Northeast India, uh, Myanmar, Mongolia, Southwest China, and we published them in the borderlands of Asia, and there's several Nosu poets uh, within uh, this uh, book. It's all English versions of it, but you know, it's another way that e-literature is taking uh, its place in the world uh, through uh, translation. Um, and also the work of Jidi Maja, um, who basically created uh, modern e-poetry in the 1980s, but he writes in Chinese. Okay, Aku Wu writes in both e and Chinese, so that's kind of a difference uh, between the, but Jidi Maja has got some very powerful positions in China. Uh, um, head of the Chinese uh, Writers Association, was a, a, gov a, a big governor or something out in Qinghai province for a while, and had these international poetry uh, contests and things like that, and his work has been translated into several uh, languages, including English by Dennis Mayer. And here's a picture of Aku Wu's uh, first, uh, this is a I, we think it's the first Norsu language poetry book in English that was published in uh, 2006, where we translated uh, several of his poems and so forth. And then he's published a few e-poems uh, with e-language in places like Basalt and some other uh, uh, literary journals. And also Bamo Chubamo is another e-poet, uh, uh, writes, writes in Chinese, uh, one of the a well-known uh, scholar, um, maybe some of you, I think, know her quite well. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, at, at my conclusion, uh, interest in e-ethnic group and e-literature has grown in China and the world since the 1980s. A uh, critical mass of interest and materials was reached by the early 2000s and resulted in several international e-conferences. Uh, of course, that included things besides literature. Um, Unique teams of international researchers formed in the late 1990s. Uh, Stephen Harrell, Bamo Ai, Bamo Chubamo, Marza is an example of anthropological and folkloristic research. In the literary fields, attention has been given to e poetry, especially the Nosu poets associated with the Liangshan region of Sichuan. Collaboration between e poets such as Jini Maja and Dennis Mayer and myself and Aku Wu Wu. Uh, collaboration in translating e traditional epic and ritual literature has increased slowly due to linguistic and cultural barriers. An example of uh, work on another group, of uh, ethnic group from Southwest China, is that of David Holm and Meng Yuan Yao, who've translated a couple of, uh, two or three at least, uh, Zhuang epics from Guangxi. It's, it's quite an interesting model that uh, they follow. Um, I think that there's an urgent task is the continued training of scholars in China and abroad to develop language competency and to further uh, collaboration for research and translation in concert with BMO and others who can read the traditional text. I think this is really a, a, a key sort of uh, a thing which should be overcome somehow or another. Uh, while thousands of texts have been gathered, care must be taken that in coming years they do not go silent from lack of persons who can read and voice them even before they are adequately studied. So that's my little talk on um, some aspects of current developments in e-literature today. So uh, thank you very much.